Welcome, everybody, to another edition of IPJ the Podcast. I'm Matthew Gonzalez, and I'm joined again by my fantabulous host, Tammy Toffinelli. How are you, Tammy? I'm doing good, exhausted, but I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're putting in the days, huh? Like a straight, what, 10, 12-hour days, uh, 24 hours a day or something? <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting in between eight and 10 hours a day right now, but I've gone 12 days straight so far and I still have another 12 to go. So you go girl, just making it happen for, uh, you know, uncle Sam, uh, um, uh, and yourself, hopefully. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be crying when my paycheck comes after I see all the taxes that have come out of it. <laughs> yeah. I feel your pain sister. I know what you mean. I, I just got back to working full time too. And they are working me 10 and a half hours a day and I get the check and it's like, where it is, where is it all at? Oh, and the pockets of the government. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And really quickly, um, I wanted to just update everybody on uh, your brother's um, situation, the case uh, with your brother. Um, can you just let everybody know you had uh, reached out to Sheriff uh, Breeze? Um, it's my cousin. He's my cousin. I apologize. Um, yes, your cousin. That's all right. No worries. Um, I did reach out to Jeremy Breeze um, via phone. He got back to me within the day. And we had a good little conversation. He is totally on board with what we're doing. Um, he did say that our main point of contact is Detective Bobman because he's the lead investigator on Ronnie's case. So any new developments, any new evidence, anything new needs to go to Detective Bobman. Um, and I asked permission if I could CC Jeremy Breeze on any documentation or anything that I'm sending or correspondence with Bobman. And he said that he was totally okay with that. Um, so I did send over Detective Bobman the second opinion of Ronnie's autopsy report. I sent that to him two days ago and I received an email from Bobman after asking him in this big old lengthy, you know, paragraph, you know, I'll be the main point of contact. Please, you know, I want to have a conversation with you. I live out of state, but a phone call gave him my phone number twice in the email twice and asked him to give me a call. And I get an email back that is literally one sentence that asked me what the forensic pathologist uh, contact information was. And that was all he said in the email. Hmm. Well, hopefully that's uh, all it's going to take for him to figure out that Ronnie didn't drown. Right. So, yep. anyways, it's good to see that there's some forward movement, even if it is um, very, very slow. Um, I know that the excuse is justice turns, uh, the wheels of justice turn very slow. Um, right. And, I, you know, no one knows that better than the, the uh, our, our special guest who's joining us tonight. Um, <laughs> he has, <laughs> he has seen the wheels of justice screech to a, a halt, pretty much, Um and uh, I want to introduce him now, none other, none other than a former Mariposa County resident and landowner, uh, Mr. Jerry Cox. Jerry, how are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing doing all right. How, how are you, Matt? I'm good. I'm good. Um, welcome to the show. Me and Tammy are very glad you could uh, join us this evening. I know it's kind of late. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. So I want to just jump right into it and find out how, how you've been doing. What's what's going on with your case and, and where where are we at right now? Uh, uh, it's just one of those things where uh, you know the judge is trying to take advantage of my due process rights and my constitutional rights and and rush the receivership. <laughs> to a discharge so that he can get the lawyers paid, you know, and as opposed to doing what's right, you know, like having some respect and then following the law, you know, uh, I'm, he doesn't even let me speak in court. It's like I show up every time, but, uh, I can't even make a comment. So I thought there was such a thing as uh, freedom of speech, you know, if I wanted to say something. So it's just a really rigged court, Matt. It's uh, the only real experience I have with court is Mariposa County, and uh, it's always been rigged, man. It's it's like theatrics, you know. They're they're trying to portray some kind of image of unbiased, but they're biased before you even walk through the door. 
Yeah. Um, um, just to catch everybody up to speed, um, Jerry Cox was um, uh, illegally um, or unlawfully accused of um, uh, kidnapping, uh, rape, and several other um, felonies uh, by a, um, a woman uh, named Ashley Harris. Um, who uh, there was overwhelming evidence immediately when she went to the California Highway Patrol office to uh, make the report. But for whatever reason, the Mariposa County Sheriff's Department decided, no, we don't need to look at the actual evidence. Let's just prosecute him. And so they put him through the ringer in the legal system. And in the meantime, they focused on taking his land. Um, there was, you know, there was minor issues that needed to be repaired. Sure, yes, nobody was in major jeopardy. No major emergencies were going to happen. A uh, couple of thousand dollars, you, you're done. But they used that minimum and for issues, minimal issues, and came up with some other craziness to literally. Um, destroy the man's property while having it in receivership supposed to be taking care of it but they actually caused more damage and then took it from him and sold it for less like half of what it was worth and now the rumor is the guy that bought it and this is rumor but the guy that bought it is connected with some bad folks and they got a little nice little grows going on up there we're, we're, we're keeping track but that's what that's what's behind all of what happened with Jerry Cox in a brief summary? Uh, do I have it about right? Jerry, you still with us? I think you timed out a little bit. Sorry. That's okay. You just uh, take your time if you can hear us. You'll be back. Mm. Hopefully. Yeah, and the funny thing about that Ashley Harris um, <clears throat> that made those false claims against Jerry, number one, uh, in his home, I, I've never... I've never been in his house per se while he has owned it, but I was in that house before he owned it with the previous owners. And from what I'm understanding, where she said that she was held captive uh -huh. was up in a loft... It was up in the loft and he had other people staying there. So if she was in any kind of jeopardy or anything like that. They would have heard her screaming. They would have heard her trying to get away. And it's in a loft. Like you've got three walls and it opens up to the rest of the house. Like yeah, how? exactly. Yes, <laughs> exactly. It didn't make a bit of sense. Um, no. And uh, it still doesn't make a bit of sense. Um, and it wasn't her first time. Apparently, she's this girl that runs around making these false accusations, trying to sue the pants off of people over false claims all the time. She had like seven other situations like this going on before her and Jerry even met. Right. Yeah. And that's um, that's one, been one of the... Um, one of the issues, too, is that uh, she's been using the system to, you know, game it this way with other uh, male victims as well. Um, and that's kind of where Mr. Angelucci came into everything, because Angelucci picked up uh, uh, with, um, with uh, another uh, attorney um, named Imran, I believe it was. Right, Jerry? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I actually have not the best service here, so my phone kind of dropped i fell out of the meeting there for a second but oh no problem we were just kind of briefly discussing uh what happened to you um and uh i gave a brief about what had had happened and uh, tammy was just following up that she remembered it, it just made no sense to her at all and uh we were talking a little bit uh, i just brought up um mark angelucci because mark angelucci um started representing you just after imran if i'm correct yeah, you know, it's a, it's a bizarre uh, outcome, you know. I, I had a normal day, come home, get arrested. And you know they're out after you because everybody knows, including three guys and a female witness, that uh, I was completely innocent. I was, I didn't even, I, I mean, I was working all day. But, uh and then uh, for them to take my ranch while my hands are tied, um, you know, I, I got a phone call from a lady that wanted to get married. Her name was Rachel. And she goes, why did you go get yourself arrested? My, you ruined my wedding day. 
I'm going down to the county. We're going to stop this forever. And I said, why did I go get myself arrested? I didn't even go get do anything. I mean, I didn't even have an argument. I just was trying to avoid somebody. And that person had a grudge against it and then made a false claim. But I didn't go get myself arrested. So she goes, well, well I'm working with the county right now, so you'll never own your land. So I actually got a text message and a, uh, uh, and a phone call from this lady um, who was a mad bride because she thought I ruined her wedding day. And she was working with Stephen Delham, the county council and other officials at the county to try to steal my property and uh, and then move me out of the county. So, like, if you ruin the guy's reputation, nobody cares about him anymore. Then you take his property and they're like, oh, whatever. Even the supervisor, Marshall Long. You know, how's that homelessness working for you, bub, kind of attitude? Wow. Um, you, you make you make people hate them, and then you take all the stuff. Uh, then people uh, are not supposed to care. And and uh, I, I know that they've done this kind of stuff to other people, a lot of other people, um, and a lot of other cases. It's just uh, here you have two individuals that you see at this conference that actually fight back, and, like, we're not going to back down because uh, – that ranch was not just my ranch. It was my dream. It was my artwork and it was my creation. I developed this, this ranch based upon childhood dreams and the people that came out had the most amazing memories. The people that understood what I was doing, there was people that were thinking I was doing a hotel. I wasn't doing any of that, but the people that came out to walk barefoot and drink wine and, uh, look at the Buffalo and uh, pan for gold and uh, touch a real log cabin and the smell and the feel and the, you know, of the old pioneer days type thing. They're the ones that knew that I was making memories that are hard to find this day and age. Yeah. And I have to go. Oh, oh, go sorry, ahead, Tammy. Man. No, I was going to say you, your family had um, property or land that just really butted right up to, to his right to, to Mr. Cox's. I do have property down in that same canyon. As a matter of fact, the name of my property is called Whiskey Flats. And it's a little ways away from where Jerry's uh, Buffalo Ranch is. But I could take a quad and travel the, the you know, the riverbed or creek bed, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, definitely down to his property, you know. Um, and we've owned our property down in that canyon, you know. It was my grandfather's. He bought it back when I was uh, seven years old. And I just assumed my portion of the property this last year. So now I am a proud Mariposa County uh, property owner. So I will always have a residence there <laughs> and they can't do anything about it. Um, you know, unless they pull a Jerry on me, which would not be okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, <laughs> and I will have to say this, you know, I've, I'm not close to Jerry. I'm an acquaintance of Jerry's. I've met him a few different times, a few different occasions, but in just the few times that I've had uh, opportunities to speak with Jerry, it was obviously before, you know, any of this happened to him. And it, this actually happened to him right around the same time that Ronnie went missing. So they had a lot of big stuff going on in Mariposa in 2017. And these kind of coincided with each other. And then we had the big Detweiler fire happen and, you know, and all that nonsense. So there was some pretty major shit going on in Mariposa in 2017. And, and back to my original thing is, is even though, you know, I'm just an acquaintance of Jerry's and I've only had the opportunity to talk to him a few times, Jerry has always been polite. He's always been respectful. He has always been very kind, very kind. And, um, you know, he is the type of guy that opens the door for, for the woman. I could even see Jerry being the type of guy to throw his jacket down over a mud puddle if it was raining outside, you know. And he always was so proud to talk about his ranch and what his hopes and dreams were for that place. And people who had gone down there and helped him live his dream, um, you know, had nothing but really good things to say about the atmosphere. And me being a canyon owner, um, it is a different kind of life. It is a different way of living. You cannot get any more fresher air. You cannot get any more sense of being one with nature and just being completely at peace than being down there. And so I am truly sorry, Jerry, that this has happened to you. And 
I hope that you get your land back and I hope that you get the justice that is due to you. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Tammy. Is Frank your, uh, is, is Frank your dad? Frank is my uncle. Okay. So he was down here when, uh, when Ronnie, when he was looking for Ronnie, you know, and he was actually here the same day that Mark Adams came to the cabin down on Mosier Canyon and broke into it and then turned around and lied to the county because he locked the place up. He locked your dad up. Your dad was on the back porch. He told me, he goes, yeah, this, some guards came down, you know, looked like crackhead guards or whatever that Mark Adams hired. They came down to the cabin. They locked up the, the gates and then your dad couldn't leave. And so when we found out that Mark Adams was down here on this side of the property, we called the County. He totally lied and said, no, he never broke into this cabin. And, uh, and and then he started making up things, saying that that I I probably did it, staged it. You know, I can't believe they would hire a guy like that. Oh, I can. <laughs> I sure can. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I I'm not surprised by anything in Mariposa County anymore. Absolutely not. And it's disgusting. Well, you know, the the, the only time I've ever gone to see a shrink was uh, right after I got arrested for like 15 felonies, and then I got released. I had to pay fifty thousand dollars to get out. <laughs> and if I didn't have it, I'd probably be in prison right now. But the thing is, is I went and talked to this lady and I'm like, how is it possible? Like, you can just have a normal day. Don't get upset at nobody. Like, I haven't got upset at anybody in years, you know, and mm -hmm. it's like, and then you go home and then you get arrested and then, you know, they're trying to frame you. I mean, man, they kept this fake rape case going, even even though she knew that there was a phone on the wall and she can call 911, but didn't do it. And then lied about her cell phone, not having service. But then we find out she was on her phone 150 times uh, and never called for help. And then still goes along with the whole spiel and story. I, it's just like, it's, it's like out of a S Stephen King book or something. It's like, it's, it's, yeah. it's amazing that they can, can keep continuing investigating and prosecuting me. Yeah. It really is, especially if they just go to the cabin and they see that where she supposedly was kidnapped and held hostage, it's a freaking loft. Well, not only that, but there was three other people with me. There was Darlene, right. Armando and Aaron. So they would all have to be trapped in the house with me because they were all with me those three days. Yep, exactly. I, mean, I would have to like I would have to barricade all four of us in there. <laughs> and, and what about her credibility she had already done this like five or seven times before she did this to you like this is her mo <laughs> well the, the reason why i stopped talking to her or seeing her was i went to tessera's wedding in jerseydale texas wedding and uh andrew tessera and uh and at the wedding she was talking to some girl in the bathroom she just met that she got raped but, you know, but by some other people or whatever, you know, a year ago or something. And then that girl told me, she's like, how well do you know her? And I go, not very well. And then like a month and she goes, well, she's telling complete strangers that she's been raped by people before. And normal women don't do that. They like they would never say that. Like they, sometimes they'll never reveal that that ever happened or whatever. But the thing is, is she was telling complete strangers. So when we came back from the wedding, which was like Sunday, I left for like Monday, Tuesday. I come back Wednesday. She's still there. You know, she knows that I was like distancing myself and I didn't want to, I, I thought she was freaking me out. I didn't want to be around her. And then, you know, on Friday when I told everybody to leave, you know, uh, the, she went down to the bar, hung out for three or four hours. And, uh, and uh, came up with a plan. You know, um, <laughs> um, I just wanted to say too that uh, the the whole um, case has really gone from just um, the receivership. Um, your case was actually uh, picked up and uh, taken into federal court because you're you're fighting um, the actual overall legal. Uh, um, uh, how do you say legal process that they used in order to take your land? So, and uh, attorney Mark Angelucci was um, instrumental in in moving forward with that case, um, if I recall uh, correct. 
you know, Imran was the master. And then he had his license taken away because his girlfriend, who's a lawyer, beat him up twice and then came back to beat him up a third time. And he fought back. And so he lost his license. And it's, it's not equality. You know, that's why a lot of these people are in the National Coalition for Men. Mark stepped in after Imran lost his license temporarily. He's going to get it back. And, uh, and uh, took over, you know, and, and Mark never really ever uh, was charged with anything ever in his life. It's just that he had a friend that was falsely accused way back in the day and he fought for him and he just couldn't believe how wrong this is Yeah, and uh, how women can just like, you know, take $3,000 for, you know, uh, uh, what was it called? Um, 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 relocation fees and then get a, like a $500 food card. And then just keep milking the system, you know, get free uh, pro bono lawyers, the best, you know, Jones Day represents her. Uh, and then not only that, uh, uh, free housing. Like it, this, you know, you can totally milk the system. And 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 then, then the guy, you know, if the cops want to frame you, they can just go, okay, you're arrested. Uh, you know, screw you. Yeah, you, you've seen that firsthand, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I wanted to kind of get into to to um, the Dateline uh, story here, um, and uh, the reason why I want to bring it up is because uh, we were hoping that the Dateline NBC episode was going to be more focused on your case and and what Mark was doing with your case. Um, I really thought the story was going to begin with uh, Mark's um, murder uh, because he was the first one. Um, to be killed by Den Hollander, but instead they spent the first 30 minutes on, on the judge without even mentioning um, Mark or the shooting um, in San Bernardino, which I just found really odd. I can understand she's a federal judge and this is horribly tragic for her. Um, but at the same time, what about Mark and his family? You know, I didn't see any of his family on there. I don't know if they were even asked and maybe they declined. I I don't know. But I didn't see any friends or any family. I saw Harry Crouch, you know, but that's part of the 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 NCFM. You know, with with the judges um family, there was family, there was friends, there was, you know, people who all spoke of great things about, you know, these people, which I'm absolutely sure they were wonderful people and, and a tragic loss for, for them and the world. Um but Mark was also a tragic loss for, for so many. Um and do you have anything to say on that, Jerry, when you watched it? You know, uh from what I understand, uh uh, it, it was a show that left a lot of questions unanswered and uh, it gave a lot of credibility to two wonderful experts, you know, um, Harry from the president of the national coalition for men and Mike, who's an ex homicide detective. Um, you know, Mariposa had and has the biggest motive. The case remains open. I'm not saying Mariposa did it. I ain't ever going to, I mean, I, I, I think anything's possible because of what's happened to me, of course, but I, I, I ain't ever going to point the finger at people for such heinous crimes, but uh, it left a lot of questions unanswered, you know? Um, and I think, uh, you know, with the Dr. Phil show that's supposed to air and a few other sh- things that are coming down the line, uh, you know, they'll probably get into more of Mark Angelucci. So wait a minute, you just made uh, some news there. Uh, the Dr. Phil show that's supposed to air? Yeah, yeah, I went down to uh, Paramount Studios uh, with uh, Crystal, uh, and we uh, uh, were on the show for like three days, and uh, and yeah, he paid for our hotel and 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 our and our meals and our drinks and stuff while we were at the hotel, and uh, we had to test for COVID two or three times a day, but you know it was worth it. Uh, I think it's supposed to come out season 19, they said, but I'm sure it's in the tumbler and it's going to come out eventually. Wow. So yeah, there, there is going to be some focus on your story then. Um, that, that's, that's really exciting because your story needs to be told. I mean, I just don't understand why it's, well, I do. I, I, 
I actually do understand why it's not being told. We don't want to go into that right now. We'll save that for another show. But I want to get into the Dateline NBC pieces because I think there's some very important stuff that's being missed here. So basically, um, I'm going to play these clips real quick. And uh, when they're done playing, um, we're gonna, I'm going to stop them and then we'll, we'll discuss uh, each one shortly, okay? So here we go. This is from the Dateline NBC, the Grudge episode. And uh, this is um, one of the clips that uh, stood out to me. So here we go. Secured the home, they secured the perimeter, and then they set up a canvas of the area. Do they find anything that's of significance? We spoke to the neighbor next door, who had actually very good information. Said he saw an individual, white male, tall, thin, wearing a mask, had a FedEx messenger bag, got into a a silver or blue uh, um, Nissan Sentra, and fled the area. He said, I know it probably has nothing to do with it 3,000 miles away. And oh we said gosh. that's exactly what happened, dressed up as a UPS guy. Are you thinking it's a long shot, but yeah, maybe this is connected? That's what we were thinking. It was uh, highly unlikely, but we had to follow every lead. The shooter fled. Mark's roommate called 911. Mark was declared dead at the scene. I was interviewed by the sheriff's detectives on there, and I says, well, you know, I don't have any proof of anything i says but here's a theory he had zeroed in on a case of marks involving public officials and alleged corruption did you think that there could have been a motive in there somewhere to to want mark dead oh yeah and if he was right what if anything did it have to do with the judge Rhonda highlighted one case in particular that had made local headlines it was the case michael the pi had also mentioned to police Mark's client, a man cleared of rape charges, was suing county officials, claiming they unfairly seized his land while he was under investigation. Is there one person in particular in that case that's popping into your head? Yes. Were the detectives looking at this person? Yes. While the agent waited for reports to come back from Quantico, an unexpected lead came in from police in upstate New York, a dead body. So this individual was found outside of the car with a gunshot wound. Correct. And something else. A dossier on Judge Salas, along with an envelope that looked like a ruse envelope. And secondly, we found a dossier on Mark Angelucci. Now, law enforcement knew for certain the two murders were connected. But how? Where was his body found? 20 feet from his vehicle in an open field. Denahan got an update from his agents. They believed the man had parked his car, walked into the field, and shot himself. Self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head with a 380 caliber handgun. A quick search of the man's car, and agents found those dossiers on the judge and Mark Angelucci. They also discovered the dead man's name, Roy Den Hollander. What were you learning about him? He was 72 years old at the time of his death. He was highly educated, was a practicing attorney. Anything else the agent wanted to know about Dan Hollander was found in a 1500 page manifesto on his computer. The pages dripped with hatred of women, like his ex-wife, a Russian bride who dumped him when she got to America. The judge and Mark Angelucci were on what appeared to be a lengthy hit list found in Dan Hollander's car. Also on that list, other judges and attorneys and something unexpected. There were people in the medical field. Doctors who had treated Den Hollander. The FBI learned from reading his website that he was dying of a rare form of melanoma. Do you think that played into what he did and kind of going out in a blaze of glory? That's a logical theory that uh, it sort of put his anger on steroids, so to speak. Hollander, the judge, and Mark Angelucci. Throughout the next few hours, we were able to piece together that the subject, Roy Den Hollander, had a professional relationship with Mark Angelucci in California. They were both part of what is described as the men's rights movement. Roy Den Hollander was actually in your group at one point, in yes. your organization. And I threw him out. Why? Well, I mean, because of his character, because of his antics. He threatened to come out to California and kick my ass. That's a quote. According to Harry, Den Hollander wanted to join the group's federal lawsuit, the one arguing against a male-only draft. Surveillance cameras captured him at the Los Angeles train station and at the one in San Bernardino. He spent a few days in the area, Denahan says, most likely tracking Mark. 
waiting for the perfect time to kill him. And then how does he get back? Same way. He immediately returns, same way. He then picked up the silver rental car in Philly and drove to New Jersey. Den Hollander had filed a similar lawsuit involving the draft. His case was in New Jersey, and presiding over the case was none other than Judge Esther Salas. I knew the case, but it wasn't one that sort of even registered as a potential threat. And you were sort of on his side, and I mean, you were you ruled for him. That's the ironic part. One of the things that stood out to me um, early on in the show was that, um, first of all, Den Hollander, they say that he, um, that he traveled to San Bernardino because he, was, he had said at one time he wanted to kick uh, Harry Crouch's ass. So that inspired him to travel to San Bernardino and hunt down Mark for whatever reason. Now I'm, I know they were involved in this alike case of, you know, about the, um, the draft and men and women being allowed, you know, to be drafted together. Um, but then Hollander had also won his case. And in fact, he won his case, uh, about the same issue with the same judge that he's, he allegedly attacked at her home. Anybody have any clue on that one? I mean, well, some, something's not adding up because uh, if the judge was his target, why, 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 why didn't he go for her? You know, something's not really adding up. You know, like, um, I mean, I was at the crime scene the day after. There was still blood on the floor. They were mopping up Mark's blood. You know, and uh, I talked to the actual eyewitness, and the actual eyewitness. The only guy that opened the door that went and grabbed, you know, that went and told Mark that he had a package. Um, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I guess eyewitnesses aren't that credible, but he well, thought he was a lot younger, you know? Yeah, that's but, what I was uh, going to say. He had a different description of the, of the guy and the guy was, uh, he described wearing a UPS um, outfit correct yeah yeah i talked to him about that i and it, and it actually looked more like a fedex really because well he said khaki brown slacks white shirt yeah he definitely thought it was a package you know but uh uh it's weird that uh hollander would come all the way over to california roam around for three or four days before he does what he has to do or whatever and then he goes to new jersey and he doesn't finish the job you know, like he commits, he offs himself, but I don't know. Oh no. You're, yeah. I, I hear you. And also, if you look at the photos that they released, he's wearing the same exact outfit, um, you know, days apart. He, he, you can't even really make it out to be him. It's a little fuzzy. So, I mean, um, but it just, it just looks so odd and he's got a big suitcase with him, um, too. Uh, so it just, I don't know. Things just don't add up. You're right. Why would you travel all the way here? But not only that, but the, the NBC didn't talk with the eyewitness at Mark's um, murder, correct? I didn't see anything in there. Uh, no, but I talked to him. He right. said uh, the dude that walked to the door looked like the guy from uh, King of the Hill. Yeah. He had the hat on, the glasses. And he said when, uh, when, when he heard the shots, there was four shots, uh, he ran to push the door shut. Mark was in the house bleeding. And he looked out the window, and the dude just walked to his – it was like a white SUV with a sunroof or something. He just walked to that, did a three-point turn, and drove away casually. Now, I want to stop you there for one second because in the NBC story – when they talk about what happened when Mark was murdered, they made it seem, and they even do a camera sweep to make it seem like the guy ran off, you know, hurriedly ran off after the shooting. But that witness, the witness literally opened the curtains or the blinds to see the guy walking away casually, get in his car, do a three-point turn because he had to turn around to go the other way. Uh, to go and leave and he wasn't doing it in a rush no speeding off or anything like that from what i understand correct that's true and uh 
he must have knew it was a dead end road too because he didn't even try that. You know, he just uh, did the three point turn. Uh, but the eyewitness, when I talked to the eyewitness, uh, he seemed to be completely coherent. He's an older gentleman. But I remember him saying that he, he heard a knock on the door. He answered it. Uh, the guy that looked like King of the Hill with the glasses on was saying, uh, Mark Angelucci. And he goes, no, I'll take it. And he goes, no, Mark has to sign for it. So he, what's interesting is he left the door ha half cocked. So if he wanted to, he could have done like New Jersey and just blasted everybody in the front room. But he left the door half cocked and the dude went up, the, the eyewitness went upstairs and yelled at Mark. Then Mark came and then the eyewitness went back down the stairs and then went out to the back patio. He opened the sliding glass door and then he heard Mark Angelucci and he goes, yeah. And he heard boom, 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 boom. And then he, the eyewitness went back through the sliding door back into the house, ran over to the door, pushed the door shut. Mark was in the house bleeding, looked through the window towards the curb and saw the guy walking. And he, yeah, he was real casual. He was like, uh, just kind of re He said he re really reminded him of the King of the Hill guy. Wow. And uh, that uh, just Jesus, but the way it, it was portrayed in the NBC, um, Dateline piece, just, um, they left out a lot of that information and, and they didn't seem to care to want to put it in because they seemed to want the, the first of all, the host of the show, I don't know if you saw that Tammy uh, or, or um, Jerry, but she was like just putting on the drama. She was like, Oh my. And you did what? And you, I mean, like she'd never heard the story before. And I think that's what irritates people about the mainstream media, the corporate media, is that instead of just telling the story, they have to make it into such a dramatic piece. that, And then they go looking for the parts of the puzzle to fit instead of trying to debunk the parts of the puzzle before they try to fit them. And well, I, it's good that you're talking to, you know, r real witnesses here like Tammy and myself because... We're, we don't care about the ratings. You know, I think what most shows do, even especially today, I, I won't name, name them, but I mean, they'll cut, splice, edit, produce. They want stuff that's going to pop, twist, and bring a bigger audience, more ratings. They don't really, if the truth is one way, but they can kind of tweak it another way, yeah, they're going to do that. Yeah. Tammy, anything else stand out uh, on that uh, documentary that they did, that NBC piece? Um, no, you guys pretty much covered it. I mean, just the whole, you know, outfit thing that just didn't add up, you know, and, and I just, you know, it, it, it's really sad that Mark got, you know, caught in the crosshairs, like the whole thing of why he was a target. Why, why did, why was he killed if he wasn't even like a part of, or even the initial target, you know, how did that even happen and, and why? And then, you know, the guy wasn't even man enough to own his own stuff. Like he went and killed himself. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's the thing that stands out to me too, about that is the, the suicide. I wanted to bring that up. Supposedly, this guy had a list of not just the judge and not just Mark, supposedly, but he also had a list of more judges and a list of doctors that he felt had wronged him. So if he had just walked up nonchalantly, shot and killed somebody with four shots and nonchalantly walked away, got in his car and drove off, first of all, someone who's never killed somebody, I wouldn't imagine is going to act that way. Then he's going to take off and go down and, you know, get in the train and, you know, go through the Bay Area and then back to New Jersey. And he's going to hang out for a little bit. And then he's going to get a mask this time. They say he wore a mask in the second one. And he's going to go to somebody's house with a, the, the mask on. I, you know, I would imagine it's the regular face mask um, for the uh, COVID thing and that he walked up to the door and that as soon as the door opened, um, he just started shooting. S then he leaves from there and he's, he's, nobody's got him. Nobody knows who he is. There's nothing on the news about anything. It's unknown, everything. Instead of completing 
more murders on his hit list, he somehow decides to just leave the evidence in the vehicle, walk 20 feet away from his vehicle, and shoot himself in the head. It sounded like, to me, what it sounds like is, is somebody walked him away from that vehicle, mm-hmm. put a gun to his head, and blew his brains out. You know what? I think you're right. You know why? Because if he was that determined to go all the way to California, spend all that money, mm-hmm. spend three days out there, who knows who he was with or talking to, then supposedly go all the way to New Jersey and then actually miss his target, on that one, uh, if he was that determined, why would he just off himself right then and there without completing the list or going back and getting the judge? Yeah, or getting more of the people on his hit list. I'm sorry, Tammy, go ahead. No, I was just saying exactly like that. That whole thing doesn't add up. He's got this whole list of people. And first of all, why was Mark, you know, why was Mark even on there if he's got a list of judges and doctors, right? Um, first of all, why the doctors, why are doctors on there? Was there something that happened in his life that caused him to not like these doctors or, or what happened? Why were those people on their judges? You know, maybe he got some kind of a sentence and he got out of prison. Who knows what the case is, but who hired him and who pointed the finger at these people to be put on this list? And what kind of payment was he looking at to be able to do this? And then on top of that, because he wasn't making his mark, maybe then, and I'm just saying this is theoretically, maybe whoever told him to go, you know, who hired him as their hitman, didn't like his job and said, all right, you're coming with me. This isn't working. Yeah, there could be many theories as to what may have occurred. Um, but until we have the factual evidence we're just left to our theories and and wondering what may have happened we just don't know and it's interesting that we haven't seen the evidence from the fbi the evidence the fbi hasn't released any of the outfits um they say he wore they still stick to the um they say in the NBC story that the um, second attack was with a FedEx uh, outfit and they say in the first attack it was a UPS outfit. Well, can we just see the outfit? I mean, didn't he have this in there? Or wasn't it his home or somewhere? I mean, this guy doesn't care. Why is he going to get rid of evidence? I mean, mm-hmm. it doesn't make a bit of sense. All this evidence should be with him or around his home in his car somewhere. But nothing's been released. You know, I... uh talked to mark angelucci's roommates and they all thought it was something to do i mean i don't want to point the finger because i'm not trying to but they all said they thought it was you know mark adams and mariposa county and that whole corrupt circle but uh and and i was actually beside myself thinking you know like i don't know what to think but uh uh and I asked him, I said, how close was Mark with you guys? And they go, oh, we all went to Vegas the weekend before this. He says, all you guys. He goes, yeah, all of us. And uh, I said, did he have an angry girlfriend? No. Did he have a, someone's boyfriend that was pissed off at him? No. This is before we even heard about Roy or before Roy even hit that judge's family. And uh, we said, uh, duh, you know, uh, there was a little spat, the one roommate said about college and you know black lives matter but that blew over so there was really i mean i i guess there's some background there where harry from the national coalition for men said they kicked him out you know roy hollander and but there was really no nothing to really be paid much a mind to about mark angelucci versus roy hollander they're i mean they they're on the same team they they got the same job done uh the, you know, nobody ever mentioned anything about a spat or argument between the two of them when it comes to the roommates. So, yeah, I don't know. A lot of open, <laughs> open questions there. You're going to say something, Tammy? No, I think uh, Jerry was still talking. Oh, sorry. No, I'm, I'm done. I'm just, I think there's a lot more. This is a much bigger issue than what's come to light so far that's all i gotta say i well, just I'm, know that it's bigger i'm gonna sweep up that trash for you jerry and i'll just go ahead and spill a little bit here 
Um, Mark was um, working closely with um, Michael and and others um, who give a damn about people. Um, he was working closely with these people to expose a massive um, ring of corruption going on in the state of California. That's the bottom line. That's what was going on. And he had to go through the federal court in order to get some relief for Jerry and to wake up the federal level as to what was going on. And so that something could be, could be, could happen. But we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of attorneys. We're talking about several businesses that are working in conjunction with county and city governments. Okay, this is no BS. This is what he was uncovering. Uh, I, I, I remember the last time that I spoke with him, he was adamant that we had to um, dig deeper. We had to you know, look further into this and look further into that. And he had the document. He had the, the facts. He had the information. And as, as I looked, I mean, it's just black and white. I don't understand how an investigator with law enforcement or forensics, you know, could not see this this stuff black and white. But it goes beyond um, him. It goes beyond me. It goes beyond Jerry. It goes beyond Tammy. It goes beyond every normal person, regular Joe in California. And, yep. and we're stuck. Yep, you're absolutely right. I know that in all of my adventures, um, just in Ronnie's case alone, but also since I've become part of um, IPJ, the podcast, you know, um, with Massengale and, and, you know, Morse and all these other things, Kamala Harris, like all these things that we're uncovering as we're digging deeper into each case, we've noticed that with every case, somehow, some way, each county is intertwined with each other all the way up, all the way up the food chain all the way up. It doesn't stop in Mariposa. It doesn't stop in Merced. doesn't stop in Tulare. doesn't stop in Fresno. They are all together, all of them. So for an investigator, FBI agent, whoever, it's not black and white because they're in on it too. That's why whatever Mark was working on uncovering hasn't come to light yet because, oh, maybe they found it. And guess what? They probably burned it in the back 40. And it all boils down to a big pot of money. Uh, yep. that's and it's a really big pot of money though we're not just talking like a, a pot yeah. of money. i mean we're talking about really because there's there's property owners like you jerry whose lands are being stolen and then resold and you know people get kickbacks and everything else um you've got judge walton who's a great example of kickbacks you were talking about how uh <laughs> women uh were being um, abused and then they'd go into these women's shelters. Well, Judge Walton makes bank off of that because he's getting a kickback on those. Um, you, you laughed, Tammy. You, you had some background for us on Walton. Walton's the judge on Luke Wiley's case. Judge Walton is the judge on on Brandy Wiley's case. Judge Walton is the judge on you know Natalie Hefner and and every other person that I know that it, in Mariposa County who has ever been ran through the court system. And you know, and I'm not saying anything bad about Natalie. I love that girl. She is amazing. She is brave. She is beyond stronger than she could ever imagine for coming forward with the things that she has come forward um you know with but obviously judge walton gets kickbacks because you have two people who have for surely murdered somebody where are they where are they yeah. all because judge walton was their judge yeah. so and judge you know, and Jerry said, I'm not afraid of what people are going to say about me or think about me. I don't care about my stats or getting ratings. I don't care about any of that. I'm going to tell you what I know and I'm going to lay it out there for you. And if you don't like it, well, you can call me. I don't care. It's cool. <laughs> judge Walton <laughs> you know? was also Jerry's judge too. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Jerry. I am yeah. so sorry. <laughs> yeah, he's my judge on everything. Ever since, ever since they tried to frame me for firewood and I took the plea bargain and they made me look guilty. And then, you know, everybody's like, man, they're really after you. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know why. Uh, 
but uh, it's just grudge. It all boils down to a grudge, I guess. You that's, know? that's prime yep. land there, buddy. That's some good marijuana growing fields you got there. But Shit. you know what's funny about that is the the land that's down in the canyon is not good growing land unless you create it. You got to sink a lot of money in there to be able to farm down there. That is red clay dirt down in that canyon. Oh, yeah. You, you can know? put up a couple of nurseries, though. You know, up in a couple of nurseries, <laughs> above ground planters, you're all good. I mean, you can see them from Google Earth. There's tons of those outdoor nurseries um, on there. several properties out there. You know, it's it's there. crazy. Well, you know, in closing, my my phone's gonna die here oh, yeah. before long. But in closing, just what I can say, real summary is, uh, I I didn't think that uh, you know the law can you know just point blank set you up, you know, and that what you see on the media is all bought and paid for one-sided or, uh, you know, uh, fraud, you know, uh, when it comes to elections don't exist. I, my, my, my eyes have been opened and, uh, I've seen it firsthand even to myself and, uh, you know, uh, the cops can frame you if they want you, they really can. If they really want you, they'll frame you. That's yep. what they can do in the county, your government. If they want your house, they can take it. They can do this shady land stealing scam and just take your house. So they don't want anybody to know about it because then you're not going to pay any more property tax. But if they want to, they can just do whatever they want. You know, they can yeah. just take your life and throw it in the trash can. If You know, it shouldn't be that way. You know, they should go after criminals. But yep. if they really want to destroy someone's life, they can. They can frame you for 15 felonies and then lock you up and then hopefully you can't post bail and then just steal all your shit. If they really want it, they can do that. That's what they did. And that's why I'm fighting back and it's not right. Yep. Well, I will say this, Jerry, you have not lost the hearts of many Mariposians. There's a lot of them that are still standing by you, still rooting for you and still there supporting, you know, your triumph through all of this for sure. And I want to throw out there, you know, that I think it's really disgusting of how deep the corruption runs to where people, you know, are losing their lives and being swept under the rug and their families are being tossed aside like nothing matters. And people's dreams of, you know, childhood dreams are being ripped away from them, you know, and and crushed for a price tag. How can you put a price on somebody's hopes and dreams? How could you put a price tag on somebody's life? How could you put a price tag on, on a family's sorrow for their loss? And I'm not just talking about my cousin. There's been so many others, so many others, you know, and you're not the first and you're not the last either to go through this either, Jerry. But I'll tell you what, you are a hero. You are strong and you are setting an example. And I hope that people um, pay better attention. And I hope this really opens their eyes up to what Mariposa County is capable of doing. You're not even safe in your own home. Yeah, that's why I went and saw the shrink. You know, it's like if they can come frame you for 15 felonies for having a normal day and get away (laughs) with it, then you're not safe nowhere. That's why I stayed out of the county for the longest time. And 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 you're you're a role model too, you know. You're 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 a strong light, you know, that people use as a beacon. And I appreciate all the words you say, and uh, and, and and we we owe my, Matt there. Uh, I think Matt's doing an awesome job, uh, you know, conspiracy wise. He, he I think he's onto something. I think so too. That's why I call him Bat Matt. <laughs> well all i do is provide a platform you guys are the real heroes and anybody who comes forward and brings their story to others to hear to try to bring it to to get justice that's the real hero i'm just a i'm just a mouthpiece that's all i am and i provide a platform for it that's it the real heroes are the people like you two who are suffering needlessly because of corruption in our in our state and national government so Well, I won't stop until justice is served for everybody involved, whether it's Jerry, whether it's my family, you know, whether it's the Massengales, I don't care who it is or anybody else that comes forward that needs assistance. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up hope. I'm not not going to give up fighting for anyone. Not ever. Everybody deserves to be heard. We're Americans. You know, we deserve to 
have every constitutional right that we've earned and fought for. And, you know, uh, the buck ends here, you know, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can to put it into this. And I'm exercising all the patience I have in the world. Uh, and, and, and hope that the judicial system, perhaps the federal courts will, will find the right path and vindicate what's yeah. needed. Yeah, so. absolutely. I mean, there is vindication needed. There's a lot of um, uh, victims out there that have been less than, left in the wake of all of this, and it, it needs to come to light. Um, well, Jerry, uh, Tammy, um, I guess we're going to bring it to, to a close here. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, on the podcast. We really appreciate you sharing more about your story, letting us know what's been going on with you, and we really wish you all the best, my brother. Well, thank you, uh, Matt, and uh, thanks, Tammy. You guys have a, a great weekend. You too, sir. You as well. Stay strong, Jerry. All Stay right. strong. You do the same. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, everybody. Well, it looks like um, that's going to do it for us here at the IPJ, the podcast, um, with my good and fantabulous friend uh, and co-host, Miss Tammy Toffinelli. How was that, um, uh, speaking with Mr. Jerry Cox a little bit there? It was really nice. It, it's good to see him still have, you know, his spirits and everything about him. And, you know, he's still he's still Jerry. So that's good that he didn't lose sight of himself through everything, because I know that's really easy to do when when you're going through the ringer like he has. You know, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I've, I've, I've had some long conversations with Jerry and, and even with Mark, excuse me, Angelucci. Um and the, there's a lot of pain in in Jerry, um, uh, you know, and you can tell. I mean, I've been I've been talking to him for a few years now, and you can tell that that it he's been he's he's been beaten up. You know, it's it's. I remember when we first got involved and started talking. You know, he he was he was happy and excited to get you know his voice out there and to get his story out there, figuring that the the public was going to rally behind him and, and news media you know would would could, their job they would do their job that's the job of the news media it's not to to tell you about you know the latest fashion melania trump or, or the new first lady miss biden uh, mrs biden is wearing no that's not their job their job is to tell you the the, the things you don't want to know about and that's the corruption by the person you voted for or the person you invested your money and hope into um it's their job to expose if they're doing the things that they're not supposed to be doing uh, am i right tammy or yeah, you're absolutely right. But unfortunately, that's not how media works anymore. You know, it used to work that way once upon a time. It yeah. doesn't work that way anymore. I mean, really, what do I see on the news anymore? It's all presidential news coverage. It's all Senate, Congress, you know, whatever, uh, House of Representatives, what's going on with stimulus, yada, yada, yada. But really, do you hear about the little boy that was drowned by his mom over in Ohio? Do you hear about the other kid that was caught in a police officer crossfire, you know, that got shot and killed? Do you hear about the man in Mariposa County who got his 430 something acre buffalo ranch taken out from underneath him? Do you hear about the kid that, you know, supposedly drowned in the river, but really didn't? Do you hear about, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on, but you don't. You yeah. hear about, you know, the new model on the runway. You hear about what so-and-so is wearing today. You hear about the new music trend going on in New York. I mean, really? Who cares? Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people's eyes should have been woken up a long time ago. By the way, there's a great um, documentary on Netflix right now. I don't know if you've seen it, Tammy. It's called Crack. Um, and it's about the uh, 80s uh, crack epidemic and how it all came about and, and what, uh, what occurred. And it's an eye-opening story that will basically help you to understand that, yeah, your government, our government, literally addicted millions of Americans just so that they could continue to fund a war. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So we'll, we, you know, check out that film. Um, and uh, I would like to discuss more about that uh, at another podcast and keep it to the facts, of course. We, you know, there's a lot of facts out there about what happened during that whole Iran-Contra thing because it also parallels with Mariposa and its airport and its um, running of um, dope and stuff uh, and cooking meth and, and cocaine and everything else going on out of that airport. Uh, something that also stood out to me too, Tammy, is that for for years, at least since the 80s, um, major business people have also mm-hmm. been dealing drugs as well as running guns and it still goes on to this day Mm -hmm. yep it absolutely does i mean we've stumbled upon the small town of mariposa that still does it to this day you know and uh, i can only imagine across the united states how prominent it still is it may not be as out there as it once was you know when mafia was more existent when you know like al capone and things of that nature it it was more prominent in those days you know and and more out there in your face you know it's not so out there anymore it's more kind of hush hush um you know but there's still gang activity there's still all that going on and you know so i i don't i don't think that times have changed that much to be honest are just i think we've just become more like ostriches and buried our heads in the sand you know to choose not to see what reality actually is and it's it's uh, america just needs to come together (laughs) that's all i can say we just really need to get our shit together (laughs) yeah i mean what is the what is the ultimate um 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 how do we say the the ultimate the way to fix it the, the ultimate fix um i mean because first you know you you don't fix cancer by just you know um talking about it and moving on mm-hmm. um you literally have to go in and remove the cancer mm-hmm. from the rest of the good part of your body and order for your body to heal and and to get better and to move on in a better and positive way that that, that's what we have to do in our society in america we have to be willing to step up and point out who the the nefarious are who the nefarious Mm -hmm. actors are we need to hold them accountable remove them from what they're doing because it's killing us it's destroying us. It's taking our money. It's incarcerating our family, our friends. Um, it's it's doing nothing positive. You know. Yeah, it's really not doing anything positive, and and really, you know, uh, little old me, little old you, uh, we can only do so much. You know, it, it's not going to take one or two people. It's going to take everyone to come together and say enough is enough and make a stand and vote whoever needs to be voted out of the sheriff's department, vote whoever needs to be voted out of the coroner's office, vote whoever needs to be voted out of, you know, your mayor, your governor, whoever. Like if, if you feel like they are not the right one, stop voting for them. Yeah. And it's hard. I was going to say it's hard in those small towns too, like Mariposa and stuff, because, you know, you went to school with old boy. You know, you, you, we grew up together. You know, I knew his mama, his daddy. We played together, you know. So he's got to be a good boy. He's got to be a good man. He's got to be, you know, the right person for the job. But, <laughs> but then when all the little stuff starts coming out, then you start defending him. Oh, no, I know him. He's a top. Who are you to say anything about that man? He's serving his, his community. Uh, they're doing this or that for the people. But you don't understand what's going on underneath. You're just giving all this shade and you don't see what's going on in, in the real light, you know? And if you did, you would be shocked. Yep. Shocked at the amount of crime that's being committed by business owners in conjunction with cartels and law enforcement. With a little dash of politicians in there, too. Those are facts. That's not conspiracy crap. That's not, you know, um, some guy screaming, you know, oh, there's a fire. It's facts. 
This is all proven. Watch the movie Crack on Netflix, everybody. You'll get a kind of a glimpse of what I'm talking about. I'm getting run, we're running a little long, I guess. Here, I guess we should uh, wrap it up, huh, Tammy? Oh, yep. It all. Uh, I got one last thing to say. It all surrounds, you know. Um, it all surrounds itself around the green, and I'm not talking about the green that spends. So. <laughs> <laughs> very nice very well put yeah yeah i i gotta back you there absolutely <laughs> so uh hopefully we can uh, get it all cleaned up um so i'm glad we had a little chance to talk with jerry uh discuss a little bit about what happened with him and then the M uh, dateline nbc um farce report um I, it just yeah i'm so glad that they pointed out the 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 loss that happened with this judge i just wish they would have um, given that equal balance to, to Mark Angelucci. He was a human yeah. being just as much as the judge and, and her son um, and, and her husband. And I just yeah. think they completely missed the mark on showing that. They, they literally went after him because he worked with the N NCFM. He, he did it pro bono, by the way, um, but mm -hmm. he did work with the NCFM. And, and they literally made it sound like it was part of a Nazi neo-male chauvinist club. <laughs> wow <laughs> and that's wow. i mean that's what they do though they they will paint the um the victims um in bad light when they don't you know when they want to sell a certain narrative and that's that's what they're doing in the andalucci story so just be yep. careful out there people all right yep. so here we go tammy another show in the uh, in the can there i guess you'd call it and uh <laughs> it was a good one i really enjoyed talking to jerry and hanging out with you yeah tonight. Yeah, it was really good talking to Jerry. I'm glad that we got a little update on where his case is at, you know, and, and got his inside opinion on the whole Dateline show and, and you know, a little bit of insight of his relationship and, and working relationship with Mark as well. So that, that was really cool. It was a really good show. And, um, you know, for all our viewers out there, don't forget to hit the like button. And don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to hit the little bell. So you get notifications. And also, if you feel feeling a little froggy, go ahead and drop a donation, even if it's just a dollar to help us out. Because sometimes, you know, if we're helping others out, we, we need a little bit of cash flow to, to be able to make copies or, or pull, you know, autopsy reports or get even second opinions on certain things. So please. Join the cause and support IPJ the podcast. Woohoo! Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, yeah, everybody. Uh, you know, we could always use the help, um, and we're we're here for you. We're an open um, a microphone to give your story uh, out there to the masses, um, so people know, and we'll finally, hopefully, start taking some action to to stop all this. Um, enough is enough. We have enough victims as it is. All right, Tammy. Well, here we go. Uh, another night uh, down, another great show. Um, remember, folks, um, we, we try to do this every week. Uh, if you can help us out, we really appreciate it. Uh, do what you can. Uh, keep yourself safe. Um, always remember to look out for each other. Stay positive. Focus on the positive. Do not focus on the negative. Find the positive in every negative and focus on that. And your life will be filled with better and positive results. Right, Tammy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Power of positive thinking always works. That's right. But if you do have issues, we want to hear about them. We're not all about just the positive either. We got to know that there's bad going on so that we can fix it. So we, we got your back. We Let got you know. back. We got you back. I love that. All right, everybody, for the IPJ podcast, I'm Matthew Gonzalez with Tammy Toffinelli. And remember, folks, it is your voice, so use it. <laughs> <laughs>